Welcome back. So, you've all heard about this case. Um, you might not have followed the latest progress of this because it has taken so many years for this uh, to go back up to, or to reach the Supreme Court, to go back down to the lower courts, go back up to the Supreme Court again who are very narrowly considering one aspect of this case. And um, following that one aspect, they remanded it back down to the lower courts again, who perhaps could consider other aspects and consider raising it back to the Supreme Court. I don't know. Um, so uh, this litigation has been protected for, for running for quite a long time. So the latest ruling that the Supreme Court had thought, uh, well, they accepted this case, uh, was on the concept of fair use. Now, if you're familiar, if you've seen um, Lawful Masses, that is L-A-W-F-U-L, Lawful Masses with Leonard French. Uh, he's a copyright attorney. Uh, he has spent quite a a bit of time explaining the four key points of the fair use test and the doctrine. Um, and so he perhaps could be considered a expert, or I'm sorry, he unquestionably could be considered an expert in that domain, and perhaps that analysis um, can somehow inspire us to think critically about this opinion. Um, so the ruling in Google v. Oracle in this particular instance before the Supreme Court is 6-2, or was 6-2, um, with Amy Conan Barrett having been late to, like, the most recent joining the court, and therefore, because she was not on uh, the court at the time this case had been argued in October, she uh, abstains in this opinion. Um, but yeah, just, uh, Justice Stephen Breyer delivers the opinion of the court, and Justice Clarence Thomas, joined by Justice Samuel Alito, dissent from the opinion. And so this, uh, courtesy of SCOTUS blog, James Ram Ramos, or, um, are explaining or summarizing the legal opinion, and they conclude this article stating that stay tuned for a deeper analysis coming soon. Um, but yeah, this is pertaining to the Android operating system, which uh, within Android itself, about 11,000 lines of declarative code from the Java Standard Edition um, library or platform had uh, these 11,000 lines of declaring just names of functions in APIs, not the underlying implementation, but the declaration of how a person would write a program and say, I'm going to implement a thing and I'm going to call it a java.lang.integer. And it's going to support the interface java.lang.number. And you can do things like add numbers and print them as strings and take a string and convert it into an integer and really really exciting stuff, I'm sure. Um, but all the underlying implementation uh, or Google had rewritten following trying to get a license with Oracle at some reasonable price, I presume, uh, for whatever the fair market value of uh, just being able to write code in Java. Um, because there are many people familiar with Java. Java is a powerful language. It runs on billions and trillions of devices. It's ubiquitous. It's uh, one of the easier languages to learn. It's taught at the high school level as part of the advanced placement tests. Uh, it's taught at colleges, universities around the world teach this language because it is for whatever challenges you might have with this language, it is well designed. And uh, Oracle had acquired it from Sun because uh, Oracle, well, we don't need to speculate why that occurred, but uh, suffice it to say Java is a useful language. 
if for Oracle to have had an interest in purchasing Java from Sun. And so years ago, I might have opined on this saying, can you really copyright a language? And I think the more and more I hear about uh, copyright law these days, I'm starting to think, you know, maybe languages could be copyrighted. Um, and it's hard for me to say that, right? Because, I mean, looking at the track record of the companies at stake here, you'd think my interests would go opposite the opinion I'm expressing. You'd think that, hey, how great it is that we can create our own Java implementations and anybody is free to make their own Java. And this potentially causes some confusion because like copyright law exists to advance the arts and sciences, right? So it gives a limited monopoly, not like unlimited, but there's some for some period of time, you have this limited monopoly and you're able to, instead of concealing all your trade secrets, you are able to express like here, I've developed this great language let me share my language with you and um, I could license whatever derivatives thereof are appropriate for me to license for a reasonable cost or maybe just choose not to license things at all if some competitor wants to take my language and start changing it and make it difficult for me to support. Um, so, yeah, this... Um, Anyway, Breyer writes that assuming for the sake of argument, yeah, just assuming so that so that the Supreme Court's able to say anything about this at all, they're assuming and remanding it back down to the lower courts to validate this, that, you know, if the code could be copyrighted, in this case, Google's copying is considered fair use by the Supreme Court, by the fair use doctrine and their four-point evaluation, which we could look at in the opinion itself. Um, really, yeah, the Fair Use Doctrine permits unauthorized use of copyrighted material in some circumstances, including when there's a transformative nature of this. And he writes, Google re-implemented a user interface where does this spell out for me, like, prior, tell us, like, isn't every interface usable? Are you talking about a user interface? Are you talking about an interface as opposed to a user interface? Do you really understand what you're talking about here? Makes me wonder. Like, all interfaces have utility and use, or potentially have this nature of being able to be used. That's why they're the boundary or the interface of the application. This is not a user interface. This is an API. This is a interface. But okay, taking only what was needed to allow users... Again, what do you mean by users here? Um, do you mean like developers? Do you mean people running the application? Do you mean everybody and every application that could ever potentially use this? Perhaps they're trying to introduce into the lexicon in the legal sense a notion of a user. It's just anyone or any process that uses. I don't know. It's surprising to see this word user even appear I just don't get it. Um, but taking only what was needed to allow users to put their accrued talents to work in a new and transformative program. I'm not so sure about this either. Like, yeah, the okay, this um, taking only what was needed is the point I'm taking issue with here now. Um, yeah, SCOTUS blog says, check back soon for an in-depth analysis of the opinion. And credit to James Ramoser for having produced this opinion, published it on SCOTUS blog. 
but yeah, we're going to take a minute and take a look at the descent here, because I think some critical questions are raised. So here's uh, Justice Thomas dissenting, um, so uh, and joined by Justice Alito. So Oracle had spent years developing a programming library. Can we zoom in this a bit so we can all read it together? Um, Oracle has spent years developing a programming library that successfully... Can I also dismiss the banner, please? I suppose not. Um, okay, we'll just deal with it. Um, thus enhancing the value of Oracle's products. Google sought a license to use the library in Android, the operating system it was developing for mobile phones. But when the companies could not agree on license terms, Google simply copied verbatim 11,500 lines of code from that library. As a result, it erased 97.5% of the value of Oracle's partnership with Amazon made tens of billions of dollars and established its position as the owner of the largest mobile operating system in the world. Despite this, the majority holds that the copying was fair use. Yeah, this is, I think, why things are more complicated than they seem at first. You can't just look at the number of lines that were copied. There's something about these particular lines that contains value. And so... Yeah, amount is one point of the fair use test, but so too, value has to be considered. This court reaches the unlikely result, or this unlikely result, in large part because it bypasses the antecedent question, which I'm also very curious about. Is the code protected by the Copyright Act? The majority purports to assume without deciding that the code is protected but a fair use analysis is wholly inconsistent with the substantial protection Congress gave to computer code. By skipping over the copyrightability question, the majority disregards half the relevant statutory text and distorts the majority's fair use analysis. Properly considering that statutory text, Oracle's code, is, Oracle's code at issue here is copyrightable and Google's use of that copyrighted code was anything but fair use. So, yeah, um, this is the perspective that uh, Justice Thomas comes from, is that instead of considering like a lines of code thing, consider that the language itself does contain some value. We can quibble about what the numbers are, but does the language have any value at all? If the language has no value, why copy it? Are not these the 11,500 lines of code that most mattered in the application from the perspective of whatever Briar would call a user? I'm just saying, I don't really know which side of this um, opinion I've come down on. If an actual analysis were to be done and try to figure out is the code copyrightable, I'm just saying it looks like the Supreme Court hasn't done its homework. And um, I think a deeper analysis is warranted. Again, I'm not an attorney. These, again, these are just my own opinions and thoughts. But when this made it to the Supreme Court, I, I don't, don't know exactly what I expected, but yeah, let's let's read on what um, Justice Thomas had written here. He says in the 1990s, Oracle made Java a programming language called Java. Like many programming languages, it allows developers to pre-write small sub-programs called methods. Methods form the building blocks of more complex programs. This progress, this process of writing software is not unlike what legislatures do with statutes. In the statutory realm, to save time and space, legislatures define terms and then use those definitions as a shorthand. For example, the legal definition of refugee is more than 300 words long. 
Rather than repeat all those words every time they are relevant, the U.S. code encapsulates them all within a single term that it inserts into each relevant section. Um, actually, this is kind of more like a macro than a method, but fine. Uh, Java methods work similarly. Once a method's been defined, developer need only type a few characters, method name and relevant inputs to invoke everything contained in the subprogram. And again, Java contains other concepts uh, like fields. Um, yeah, there's other ways that uh, code can access things in global or local scopes. Uh, that's not his main point here. His main point is that there's some notion of defining things and then using them elsewhere. And that for this to be done efficiently, you want to use a good language. You don't want to just come up with your own language. You, I mean, people who design their own language, there are tons of amateurs who design their own languages. And it's rare for languages to gain traction. Um, See, so yeah, a programmer familiar with pre-written methods can string many of them together to quickly develop complicated programs. I think what he means is complex programs, things that have complex behaviors, regardless of how simple the code itself is. Um, but yeah, really the value in writing software is being able to take various pieces and assemble together the most valuable product and then be able to have a good way to test and release and develop and test and release develop etc uh, just end up in this loop where you're able to efficiently put together pieces of your own software uh, in combination with other people's software in a very structured form so again you're just focusing on methods but developers use two kinds of code the first being the declaring code names the method, defines the information that it can process, and the you know, kind of data it can output. It is like the defined term in a statute. Actually, yeah, I think I understand why he's focusing on methods. It's because of the 11,500 number given above. Um, the second, the implement, uh, implementing code, often colloquially referred to as implementation, um, but yeah, run, includes the step-by-step -step instructions that make the methods run. <sighs> okay. I mean, I get what he's getting at. That's uh, technically that one way to interpret this. It's an interesting analogy. But okay. But yeah, it's like the detailed uh, definition in a statute. Fine. Uh, his clerks must have had fun writing this. Uh, Oracle's declaring code was central to its business model. It profited financially by encouraging developers to create programs written in Java. Yeah. Oracle's written books about like how you learn to write stuff in Java. They've had conferences about developing software in Java. Like, Oracle's immensely invested in Java. And then they charge manufacturers a fee to embed Java into their devices. Yeah, 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 they do. And to this end, they created a work called the Java 2 Platform Standard Edition, aka Java 2, uh, which included a highly organized library. 11,500, etc., whatever, say... I mean, yeah, here they mention 30,000 methods. Presumably not all of them are used by every program, but the notion that uh, Oracle had some of its declarative code copied. Um, I mean, we all know how software works. I don't need to go belabor the point here, but it's the organization of the code that's of value. Yeah. If somebody were to take, you could take the other 99% of it and just remove all the method declarations. You know, I would challenge the court to remove all the method declarations and write a program that can do anything useful. That's my challenge to the Supreme Court, to Justice Breyer. Remove all of the method signatures and show me a useful program that uses the 99% that was not considered in the analysis. 
I think um, Oracle could make some interesting points, but it's too late at this point. It's been argued before the Supreme Court. They're not going to welcome another question asking about fair use. It's, um, so I think this dissent tries to set straight the record about where the value actually lies. Um, it doesn't rely, like, yeah, here they provide an example, static int max num x, y, z. Here's just a way you could write code. It doesn't really matter how these lines are written. What matters is that you have a function max num and it returns the maximum number. I don't care how you wrote it. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you have the declarative form of the code and that somehow some magic happens here that can satisfies the condition in the contract. That's what makes Java powerful, among other things. Uh, the founder of Android, Andrew Rubin, understood that declaring code was copyrighted, so they uh, sought a co custom license from Oracle. At least four times the two companies attempted license negotiations and were unsuccessful in part because of trust issues. When negotiations broke down, Google simply decided to use Oracle's code anyway, instead of creating its own declaring code as Apple and Microsoft used to do, Google copied verbatim 11,500 lines of Oracle's declaring code and arranged that code exactly as Oracle had done. It then advertised Android to device Mac manufacturers as containing core Java libraries. Oracle predictably responded by suing Google for copyright infringement. The Federal Circuit ruled that Oracle's declaring code is copyrightable and that Google's copying of it was not fair use. And that's the Federal Circuit's opinion. So Federal Circuit has some smart people on it. Um, again, I don't know like if I'd come down the same way as either side. Both sides are arguing for some really strange or they're rather arguing for some extreme um, perspectives here. Uh, Oracle would prefer not to be sued at all. I'm sorry, Oracle, Google would prefer not to be sued at all. Oracle would prefer to get something. And I don't know how you ultimately resolve this tension. Um, perhaps in the future, the legislature could consider some kind of copyright act that, um, I mean, yeah, here's the copyright law background in question. Patent law generally protects inventions. Library of uh, copyright law protects works of authorship. Library of code straddles these two categories. It's highly functional, like an invention, yet as a writing, it's also work of authorship. Faced with something that could fit in either space, Congress chose copyright, and it included declaring code in that protection. So, yeah, potentially Congress chose incorrectly, I don't know. Maybe it makes more sense to consider this under patent law. Um, who knows? What would you have? If you had to patent code, how would that even work? That's complicated. But no, Congress chose copyright, so we stick with Congress precedent, for at least for now until we find some reason that we absolutely must overturn it. Um, and so it does expressly protect computer code, and it recognizes that computer programs protect it, and it defines this this way and so forth, even without that express language um, about a set of statements or instructions that can be used directly or indirectly in a computer in order to bring about a certain result which obviously includes code. Um, even without the express language in the Copyright Act, um, yeah, this would satisfy the general test for copyrightability. So, yeah, the question is not, is the code copyrightable? The question is, is this fair use? And as uh, Thomas points out above, it doesn't look like fair use to him. Um, are there other points to consider?
Um, okay, so Google acknowledges the cop implementing code is protected by the Copyright Act. So this is an interesting position too. So Google acknowledges that the 99% part other than the declarative code is protected. And then Google contends that the declaring code is much more functional, much more abstract and a method of operation outside of the scope of protection. And Thomas says, well, that argument fails. As the majority correctly recognizes, declaring code and implementing code are inextricably bound. Declaring code defines the scope of an implementing code and gives a programmer a way to use it by shortcut. Because declaring code incorporates implementing code, it has no function on its own. Implementing code is similar. Absent declaring code, Developers would have to write every program from scratch, making complex programs prohibitively time-consuming to create. The functionality of both declaring code and implementing code will thus uh, typically rise and fall together. So, yeah, this particular argument that, hey, we were just using the declaring code, that just, yeah, it, lies in the face of reason. I, I don't understand this particular argument. Many other arguments I could understand, but this one, yeah, like I was saying earlier, good luck writing any kind of useful program without the declaring code. And given the declaring code, writing the implementation seems pretty trivial. Um, so comparing um, it, like, trivial in the sense that if you had to like completely invent a language from scratch, that's a much harder task than just in, uh, writing the implementation for an existing declaration. The design of language has value. How much value does it have? We don't know. How limited should the time of a copyright be for software? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, these are, and that's not going to be decided anytime soon either. I doubt it. I'd be surprised if, like, we were to say, oh, Java should be copyrighted for 50 years or 20 years or two years. That's not going to get decided. For, it's not been decided in the past. It's not going to be decided anytime soon. Even this case of Oracle v. Google uh, or Google v. Oracle is not going to cause the Supreme Court to rule, like, how long does a copyright last? There's, I'd be astounded if the lower court then brought up the point that, like, well, how long does copyright last? Um, yeah, it seems to me like the lower court's not going to have an opportunity to bring that up, but even if they did, I don't know. There's really not too much precedent, although time will build a precedent for this. But yeah, I, I'm curious just how many decades it will take to build up that precedent until the court actually opines on duration of copyright. Um, so yeah, Google's argument can also not account for Congress decision to define it as a set of statements or instructions used directly or indirectly in order to bring out a certain result. Hence, Congress rejected any categorical distinction between declaring and implementing code. And uh, yeah, so yeah, hence method of operation, etc. Yeah, what has me curious is just how, what the limitation on damages from copyright infringement is. I'm curious how that calculus could work, other than in this insurance sense of let's gamble and see whether we get away with it or not. There has to be something on the other end of, okay, we didn't get away from it. We didn't get away with uh, this plagiarism, if it is that. Um, what's the maximum in damages you'd have to pay in such a case? How would you... Uh, you have to come up with some way with evaluating or evaluating a language and saying how much is a reasonable fee to be charging, which seems 
you'd more likely settle that out of court than actually publish the number, but I'm curious. Google also contends that declaring code is not copyrightable because the merger doctrine bars copyright protection when there's only one way to express an idea. This is the other thing I find astounding. Um, there is more than one object-oriented language in the universe. There's Python. There's C++. There's Ruby. There's J. There's D. There's all these other object-oriented languages out there. There is not only one way to express an idea. So that particular argument nobody's buying. I, I don't even think the majority accepted that particular one. Um, so the court inexplicably declines to address copyrightability. Its sole stated reason for declining to address is that technological, economic, and business-related circumstances are rapidly changing. That, of course, has been a constant where computers are concerned. Rather than address the principal question about copyrightability, the court simply assumes that declaring code is protected and then concludes that every fair use factor favors Google. I agree with the majority that Congress did not shield uh, computer programs from the ordinary application of fair use, but the majority's application of fair use is far from ordinary. By skipping copyrightability, the majority gets the methodology backward, causing the court to sidestep a key conclusion that ineluctably, I'm not familiar with this word, but I think this means without eluding, it ineluctably uh, affects the fair use analysis. Congress rejected uh, categorical distinctions between declaring and implementing code. The majority creates just such a distinction. The result of this distorting analysis is an opinion that makes it difficult to imagine any circumstance or yeah, circumstance in which copywriting code or declaring code will remain protected by copyright. And this this last point here, this the result of this distorting analysis is an opinion that makes it difficult to imagine any circumstance in which declaring code will remain protected by copyright. That is why I am talking with us today. So yeah, that's the concern. Really, I don't have a particular stake as far as I know in this outcome of this um, whether Google wins or Oracle wins or what even you call winning. I don't have a stake in that outcome as far as I know. Um, I know Java is a great language. It's um, fairly accessible. There are some things I don't like about it, but it is what it is. It's um, ubiquitous. Um, and I could understand that it's easy uh, to convince um, hardware manufacturers, hey, I've got uh, this thing, I, Google here in this case, want you to produce these chips that um, operate my Android operating system. Arguably, an Android operating system Maybe that is fair use. I'm actually curious because that seems to be like the one thing that the transformative nature of that could completely tip the scale against everything else I'm talking about today. But what I'm concerned about today is that the result of this distorting analysis, that somehow there is this difference between declaring and implementing code. Uh, like, and this leads to it being very difficult to understand any circumstance in which declaring code will remain protected by copyright. When you go to a store, you buy a game off a shelf. I mean, yes, there's art assets, there's music assets, there's all kinds of assets inside the game. The game might have some online capability, but maybe not. 
And if you were to copy that game and give it to your friend, what laws are you breaking? Or rather, if you were to take that game, copy it, and give it to 10 billion of your friends, not that anybody has that many friends, but if you were to make so many copies of this game, what law are you breaking? Oh, well, you copied the declaring code. Oh. Okay, so now we understand that if somebody were to take a game and rewrite all the declaring code, now they'd only be in, um, uh, offending, I guess, on terms of the music assets, art assets, all these other assets that are part of the game. If somebody were to take, say, the game of Celeste, where the implementation as well as the API are both public, and say they were to change the art assets, say they put their own music into that game, if they were to rewrite the implementation to keep the API the same, if the character moved exactly the same way, just the art assets look different and the code that ran it was different, would that be a violation? The character would operate the same way in the environment. Um, you could argue maybe the level design needs to be changed up a bit, but like all the physics would be the same. Yeah, I don't understand. Like, you could potentially take any game, even the ones that, like, Nintendo will sue people about, and say, oh no, that's too similar to our game. No, that's, that's a copyright violation. And here you have the Supreme Court arguing, well, declaring code uh, is not copyrightable. Only the implementing code is copyrightable. So the notion that you could have declaring code that says, like, here's a character, this character jumps in this certain way, and this, like, this is basically, the way this is written, allows for retro gaming to be uh, legal. Minus all the art assets and music assets and other asset questions, this is legalizing emulation. Or at least saying the court declines to comment on such things. Like, that's pretty radical to say that anybody can now make a system that interfaces with any video game. Because, oh, we're only talking about declarative code, not implementing code. So maybe this does advance the arts and sciences the way it's written. Um... But by saying, like, if you were to just copy somebody's declarations and implement it any way you chose, and that implementation could greatly differ, that, like, the original product's no longer copyrightable is kind of astounding. I'm, maybe I'm not understanding this correctly, but, yeah, having listened to um, uh, Leonard French and Lawful Masses, um, their brief look at the summary of this, having looked at the majority opinion, having read what we've read from SCOTUS blog and a couple other sources, I am a bit astounded and confused by this conclusion. It would be a nice conclusion to draw if that were the law. Uh, I mean, if this going into this both parties could have known that that was the deciding factor. I'm sure trade secrets would be guarded a bit differently. You know? I don't know what this means for trade secrets going forward if works aren't copyrightable. That's really confusing. I don't know that the Supreme Court, these nine people who have this tremendous weight, I don't know that they've adequately considered what this judgment's going to do to software development in the future. Um, it's possible maybe in some future case they might revisit and see, oh, wait, well, no, we didn't mean it that way. We meant something else, really. <sighs> I don't know. It's strange. Maybe, again, I could be misreading this, but goodness.
But yeah, but whether a statutory fair use factor favors one side or favors the other is a legal question reviewed de novo. Yeah, like this, yeah, Congress has established four statutory fa fair use factors for courts to weigh. Three decisively favor Oracle. And even assuming that the remaining factor favors Google, that factor, without more, cannot legally establish fair use in this context. So, yeah. This is interesting. The majority holds that every factor favors Google by relying on a distinction that it is drawn. Tellingly, the majority evaluates the factors neither in sequential order nor in order of importance. Instead, it starts with the second factor, the nature of the copyrighted work. It proceeds in this manner in order to create a distinction between declaring and implementing code that renders the former less worthy of protection than the latter. Because the majority's mistaken analysis rests so heavily on this factor, I begin with it as well. All right, we're going to read through the rest, even though I'm not sure what more I can add to Justice Thomas' opinion, but it needs to be read. This factor, the nature of the copyrighted work, uh, requires courts to assess the level of creativity or functionality in the original work. It generally favors fair use when a copyrighted work is more informational or functional than creative. Um, so because code is predominantly functional, this factor will often favor copying when the original work is computer code. But because Congress determined that declaring and implementing code are copyrightable, this factor alone cannot support a finding of fair use. The majority, however, uses this factor to create a distinction between declaring and implementing code that, in effect, removes copyright protection from declaring code. It concludes that, unlike implementing code, declaring code is far from the core of copyright because it becomes valuable only when third-party computer programmers value it and because it is inherently bound together with uncopyrightable ideas. Uh, from the same opinion above at 23 to 24. Uncopyrightable ideas. Okay. Congress, however, rejected this sort of categorical distinction that would make declaring code less worthy of protection. The Copyright Act protects code that operates in a computer in order to bring about a certain result, both directly implementing code and indirectly declaring code. Section 101 of the Copyright Act. And if anything, declaring code is closer to the core of copyright. Uh, developers cannot even see the implementing code. Uh, from another opinion, uh, from another judgment here. See also at 23, declaring code is user-centered. Implementing code that thus conveys no expression to developers, declaring code, in contrast, is user-facing. It must be designed and organized in a way that is intuitive and understandable so developers are to developers so they can invoke it. Even setting those concerns aside, the majority's distinction is untenable. True, declaring code is inter inherently bound together with uncopyrightable ideas. Is anything not? Books are inherently bound with uncopyrightable ideas. The use of chapters, the use of having a plot, of including dialogue or footnotes, this does not place books far from the power of copyright. And implementing code, which the majority concedes is copyrightable is inherently bound up with the division of computing tasks that cannot be copyrighted. We have not discounted a work of authorship simply because it's been associated with non-copyrightable ideas. While ideas cannot be copyrighted, expressions of those ideas can be copyrighted. I mean, he's citing a source, but like, duh, expressions can be copyrighted. Like, yes. This is a well understood standard. Uh, similarly, it makes no expression or difference that the declaring code depends on how much time 
third parties invest in learning it. Many other copyrighted works depend on the same. A Broadway musical script needs actors and singers to invest time learning and rehearsing. But a theater cannot copy a script, the rights to which are held by a smaller theater, simply because it wants to entice actors to switch theaters, and because copying the script is more efficient than requiring actors to learn a new one. So, yeah, I think Justice Thomas is just trying to make the point here that you need to do the analysis. You can't just not do your homework. There could be other factors that weigh in favor of this, but um, you still need to do the analysis. The majority says of declaring code is no less true of implementing code. Declaring code is how programmers access pre-written implementing code. The value of that implementing code is thus directly proportional to how much time programmers use the associated declaring code. The majority correctly recognizes that declaring code is inextricably bound up with implementing code, but it overlooks the implications of its own conclusion. Only after wrongly concluding that the nature of declaring code makes that code generally unworthy of protection does the court move on to the other factors. This opening mistake taints the court's entire analysis. Okay, B. And, I mean, yeah, I've ranted on for the longest time here. I think we understand where Justice Thomas is coming from. I think we understand where I think, like, to do an analysis, you have to actually do the analysis. You can't just come up with this distinction that just waves away the need to do the analysis. It's, I struggle it, to understand this. It's, um, I mean, thankfully, I'm not a justice, but, man, it's confusing. And I don't know what this is going to mean for APIs, our ability to publish things going forward, or ability to say, I can tell somebody this one thing and it will remain copyrighted. Or are we going to have to resort to trade secrets from now on? That's the concerning part to me. All right. But on to other factors, let's suppose that somehow the main majority opinion still maybe applies somehow, despite m missing this key point. Undoubtedly, the single most important element of fair use is the effect of Google's copying upon the potential market for or value of Oracle's copyrighted work. As the Federal Circuit correctly determined, evidence of actual and potential harm stemming from Google's copying was overwhelming. By copying Oracle's code to develop and release Android, Google ruined Oracle's potential market in at least two ways. First, Google eliminated the reason manufacturers were willing to pay to install the Java platform. Google's business model differed from Oracle's. While Oracle earned revenue by charging device manufacturers to uh, install the Java platform. Google obtained revenue primarily through ad sales. Its strategy was to release Android to device manufacturers for free, and then use Android as a vehicle to collect data on consumers and deliver behavioral ads. With a free product available that included much of Oracle's code, and thus with similar programming potential, device manufacturers no longer saw much reason to pay the, to embed the Java platform. For example, before Google released Android, Amazon paid a license to embed the Java platform in Kindle devices. But after Google released Android, Amazon used the cost-free availability of Android to negotiate a 97.5% discount on its license fee with Oracle. Evidence at trial similarly showed that right after Google released Android, Samsung's contract with Google dropped from 40 million to about 1 million. Google contests none of this except to say that Amazon used a different Java platform, Java Micro Edition instead of Java Standard Edition. That difference is inconsequential because the former was simply a smaller subset of the latter. Google copied code found in both platforms. The majority does not dispute or even mention this enormous harm. 
Second, Google interfered with the opportunities for Google to license or for Oracle to license the Java platform to developers of smartphone operating systems. Before Google copied Oracle's code, nearly every mobile phone on the market contained the Java platform. Oracle's code was extraordinarily valuable to anyone who wanted to develop smartphones, which explains why Google tried no fewer than four times to license it. The majority's remark that Google also sought other licenses from Oracle and Tia 33 does not change this central fact. Both parties agreed that Oracle could enter Google's current market by licensing its declaring code. By copying, but by copying the code and releasing Android, Google eliminated Oracle's opportunity to license that, uh, its code for fair use. The majority writes off this harm by saying the jury could have found that Oracle might not have been able to enter the modern smartphone market successfully. But whether Oracle could itself enter that market is only half the picture. We look at not only the potential market that creators of original works would in general develop, but also those potential markets the copyright holder might license others to develop. A book author need not be able to personally convert a book into a film, so long as he can license someone else to do so. That Oracle could have licensed its code for Android is undisputed. Unable to seriously dispute that Google's actions had disastrous effect on Oracle's potential market, the majority changes course and asserts that enforcing copyright protection could harm the public by giving Oracle the power to limit the future of creativity on programmers on Android. But this case concerns only versions of Android released through November 2014. Um, let's see, order number 10. Google has released six major versions since November 2014. Only about 7.7% of active Android devices still run the versions at issue. The majority's concern about a lock-in effect might carry more weight if the suit still convert concerned versions of Android widely in use or that will be widely in use, it makes little sense in a suit about versions that are close to obsolete, uh, or that are close to obsolete. The majority's concern about a lock-in effect is also speculation belied by history. First, Oracle never had lock-in power. The majority again overlooks that Apple and Microsoft created mobile operating systems without using Oracle's declaring code. Second, Oracle always made its declaring code freely available to programmers. There's little reason to suspect Oracle might harm programmers by stopping now. And third, the majority simply assumes that the jury, in a future suit over current Android versions, would give Oracle control of Android, instead of just awarding potential damages or perpetual royalties. If the majority is going to speculate about what Oracle might do, it should at least consider what Google has done. The majority expresses concern that Oracle might abuse its copyright protection on Android, outdated Android devices and attempt to monopolize the market. But it is Google that recently fined a record $5 billion for abusing Android to violate antitrust laws. In the European Commission um, European Commission press release commission fines Google uh, 4.34 billion for illegal practices regarding Android mobile devices to strengthen dominance of Google search engine. Google controls the most widely used mobile operating system in the world, and com companies can now freely copy libraries of declaring code whenever it is more convenient than writing their own. Others will likely hesitate to spend the resources Oracle did to create intuitive, well-designed libraries that protect, that attract programmers and could compete with Android. If the majority is worried about monopolization, it ought to consider whether Google is the greater threat. By copying Oracle's work, Google decimated Oracle's market and created a mobile operating system now in over 2.5 billion actively used devices earning tens of billions of dollars every year. If these effects on Oracle's potential market favor 
Google. Something is very wrong with our fair use analysis. Now that's, again, that's Justice Thomas' opinion. Um, so let me think. If these effects on the Oracle's potential market are in favor of Google, then something is wrong with our fair use analysis. I'm trying to think if there's any way I could rebut this. Um, so again, these are just two points in, in the four point fair use evaluation. Surely the other two points cannot stand, right? Purpose and character of the use. Second most important factor the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is a commercial nature or for a nonprofit. Well, I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. Um, it's true that Google rate reduced and greatly reduced Oracle's market. I don't think it's as clear cut as is expressed by Justice Thomas here. I do think that, um, you know, Google could have produced an API and they have a lot of smart people there at Google. They didn't have to copy the API. They could have come up with something compelling. Uh, they probably still would have ended up before a court uh, because there'd be this same business tension where Google creates an API that functions very similar to what they've done. Um, so I think we'd still, hmm, I'm not sure. Um, I think probably we would have seen Oracle's sales greatly decline because Google has smart people. They would have come up with, and with some fairly reasonable API that didn't outright copy. Uh, I think Oracle's case would be weaker if Google had simply produced something and not made it the same thing as Java. Um, I think it is possible to innovate. Um, certainly after uh, whatever the older version of Android was, the only about 7.7% .7 of Android version devices still use the versions at issue here. So yeah, Google innovates. They could have innovated, um, as they have shown their capacity to do. Um, in this case, for anything after November 2014, Google has definitely innovated. Um, they really didn't have to step on what Oracle was doing. It's possible this um, Oracle's market was doomed anyway. That's a mitigating concern, but no, in terms of just the base fair use analysis, Thomas might be right. I don't think we're going to reach the same conclusion that Thomas reaches that, um, yeah, no, like this, the majority simply assumes that the jury in a future suit would uh, give Oracle control instead of just awarding damages. Yes, yeah, so I think this is the piece here that like what would damages even be in a case like this where uh, Java was copied there are damages it's not unlimited damages there are definitely a lot of mitigating concerns at play here that favor Google but um, yeah no I think the notion that our full fair use analysis just completely favors Google is confusing. So yeah, I think Oracle, at least on those first two points of the fair use analysis, it strongly favors Oracle, but there are many mitigating circumstances which will reduce the amount of damages that are awardable. That would be how I would assume that would play out. And I'm astounded. Well, anyway, we haven't read the main opinion yet. I've skimmed it. It's 
the same as all the newspapers and articles and SCOTUS blog report it to be. It's exactly what you'd expect, but it's this dissent that's interesting. Second most important factor, the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or for nonprofit educational purposes, requires us to consider whether the use was commercial and also to consider whether it was transformative. And um, yeah, beginning with the overwhelming commercial nature of Google's copying, you know, I wonder. Just because Google obviously is this entity, it's a corporation, just because they do business, does that mean that the copying of an API is commercial? I mean, Google is a corporation, it's a commercial actor, but suppose they had produced something and they didn't call it Java. Suppose, I don't know, they produce something and they call it Groovy. And um, let's say, yeah, they got this Google Groovy thing and it serves a similar form and function. It could have a different internal composition. It could have different declaring code. Everything about it at surface level and underneath could be different. I don't think it would have taken... I think Google could have figured out some kind of solution um, with this hypothetical Groovy language. And I use Groovy because like that's a language they've actually... Eh. Maybe I've got my history confused, but I seem to remember Google had invented a language Groovy. And again, I could be confused. I know it's Apache Groovy now, but I thought it had originated with Google. So let's say that we have Groovy OS, just hypothetically. So is whether Google creates this Groovy OS instead of Android OS, like if this internally makes no use of Java, is that commercial in nature? How, how commercial is it if they're operating in the same market space and producing the same effect? Is it really? How commercial is that? I don't know. Like if they produce, if they compete in the same space and could just as easily, I mean, arguably, training developers, learning this new language, um, all this extra work that would have been required to do so. Um, I don't know that forcing people to do extra work just for the sake of doing extra work, but otherwise having the same market outcome. I don't know that that is commercial in nature. So, yeah, I'm not really sure that had they done the same thing, but just, or had they had the same effect in the market, there would have been some small ramp up time required to train developers and everybody at Google would have figured it out. They're smart. So why this obsession with um, use of Java being considered commercial? I don't know. I mean, yes, very strong arguments could be made that um, using this Java thing, using the declarative code with people with, who are familiar with um, that particular API could make it easier to onboard developers. But I'm not so sure Maybe I'm confusing this with one of the other fair use factors, but there are concepts in any system that are just natural phenomena. So I'm not entirely, like as much as we call this commercial, I'm not 
necessarily following. It's kind of... I guess we'll just consider the facts as they are, but I'm saying that it's possible, I think, to reach a different conclusion, even if most of these factors weigh in favor of Oracle. So I don't think it's so clear, and I could be confused, and my analysis could be poor, but I'm doing the best I can to try to challenge this and attempt to think critically about it, uh, as is everyone. Um, and whether this is transformative. So, again, with the commercial nature of the copying, yes, yeah, so there's business at play. Majority attempts to dismiss this by noting that commercial use does not necessarily weigh against fair use. Um, true enough, commercial use sometimes could be overcome by use that is sufficiently transformative. But we can ignore Google's intended purpose of supplanting Oracle's commercially valuable platform with its own. You know, I'm not sure. So this implies that just because Oracle owns this language, that the, their ownership of the language is valuable. I'm not so sure it's so easy to declare that here. Regardless, oh, let me actually read what you wrote. Sorry. Um, so, but we cannot ignore that this intended purpose now, this is an intention, not a reality. This is an intention um, of supplanting Oracle's commercially valuable program platform with its own. Um, even if we could, we have never found fair use for copying that reaches into the tens of billions of dollars and wrecks the copyright holder's market. Again, it's a question of who owns the language. Regardless, Google fares no better. Huh? Really? A typo? In an opinion. Regardless, Google fares no better on transformative use. A court cannot, a, a court generally cannot find fair use unless the copier's use is transformative. Um, so these examples of transformative use, they're guided by fair use of the preamble, such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship or research, things that like make my analysis and sharing this. Whatever you'll say about my analysis, I'm, I'm making some effort to transform this and hopefully you judge me fairly. Um, all these examples are not exclusive. They are illustrative and Google's repurposing of Java code from larger computers to smaller computers resembles none of these particular purposes, like research or news reporting or teaching. Um, so Google did not use Oracle's code to teach or to reverse engineer a system in order to ensure compatibility, instead to avoid the drudgery in working up something fresh. Google used the declaring code for the same exact purpose Oracle did. And the Federal Circuit correctly, or as the Federal Circuit correctly determined, there's nothing fair about taking a copyrighted work verbatim and using it for the same purpose and function as the original competing platform. So, and that's not to say that this in totality can be used here. The majority, the majority, acknowledges that Google used the copy declaring code for the same reason Oracle did. So by turns, the majority transforms the definition of transformative. Now we are told transformative simply means, at least for purpose of computer code, a use that will help others create new products. Uh, or now we are told this is what transformative means. This new definition eviscerates copyright. A movie studio that converts a book to a film without permission of the author um, only creates a new product, the film, but enables others to create products, film reviews, merchandise, YouTube, highlight reels, late night television reviews, and the like. Nearly every computer program, once copied, can be used to create new products. 
surely the majority would not say that an author can pirate the next version of Microsoft Word simply because he can use it to create new manuscripts. Ultimately, the majority wrongly conflates transformative, transformative use with derivative use. To be transformative, a work must do something fundamentally different from the original. A work that simply serves the same purpose in a new context, which the majority concedes is true here, is derivative, not transformative. Congress made clear that the Oracle holds the exclusive rights to prepare derivative works. Rather than create a transformative product, Google profited from exploitation of the copyrighted material without paying the customary price. Thus, amount and substantiality of the portion use. The statutory fair use factors also instruct us to consider the amount and substantiality of the portion used in, rel in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. In general, the greater the amount of use, the more likely the copying is unfair. Same document. But if, even if the heart, or even if the copier takes only a small amount, copying the heart or focal points of a work weighs against fair use as in Harper, unless no more was taken than necessary for the copier to achieve transformative use. Uh, because the majority is the reasoning would undermine copyright protection for so many products long understood to be protected. I understand majority is holding as a good for declaring code only precedent. Right, so he's saying this is just limited to software. We're not going to undermine all of copyright law just because of this opinion. Um, Google does not dispute the Federal Circuit's conclusion that uh, the copy the heart or focal points of Oracle's work. The declaring code is what attracted programmers to the Java pro platform and why Google was so interested in that code. And Google copied that code verbatim, which weighs against fair use. The majority does not disagree. Instead, it concludes that Google took no more than was necessary to create new products. That analysis fails because Google's use is not transformative. Um, let's see, Campbell 510 at recognizing this fourth factor, we're harking back to the purpose and character statutory factor. This factor thus weighs against Google. Even if Google's use were transformative, the majority is wrong to conclude that Google copied only a small portion of the original work. The majority points out that the 11,500 lines of declaring code, enough to fill about 600 pages in appendix, in the legal appendix, um, or just a fraction of the code uh, in the Java platform. But the proper denominator is declaring code, not all code. A copied work is quantitatively, quantitatively substantial if it could serve as a market substitute for the original work or potentially licensed derivatives of that work. The declaring code is what attracted programmers and it is what made Android a market substitute for potentially licensed derivatives of Oracle's Java platform. Google's copying was both qualitatively and quantitatively substantial. In sum, three of the four statutory fair use factors weigh decidedly against Google. The nature of the copyrighted work, the sole factor possibly favoring Google cannot by itself support a determination of fair use because holding otherwise would improperly override Congress determination that declaring code is copyrightable. The majority purports to save for another day the question whether declaring code is copyrightable. The only apparent reason for doing so is because the majority cannot square its fundamentally flawed fair use analysis with the finding that declaring code is copyrightable. The majority has used fair use to eviscerate Congress considered policy judgment. I respectfully dissent. To be sure, these factors are not necessarily exclusive, but they're especially relevant. The majority identifies no other relevant factors, and I can think of none that would overcome the overwhelming weight of these key factors. Um, yeah, so say what you will about 
I mean, yeah, this legal case has been drawn out since at least 2014 and will continue. Technology evolves so quickly these days. Um, let's go back to the top of the analysis here. Um, and yeah, these. this is just the dissent. You can read the majority opinion and try to make sense of it. Um, I, I've skimmed through the majority opinion and I'm perhaps not qualified to try to interpret um, it. I have made my best effort to try to understand in my skimming of it and my reading of articles that have been written about this opinion. Um, I've done the best. I'm trying to try to understand like this. Uh, the majority opinion just baffles me. Um, I think the notion that this has gone all the way up to the Supreme Court is kind of amazing because, um, I mean, yes, the parties in the case here are certainly competing, but this is going to be a finding over uh, whether or not there are damages. I mean, ultimately, this is what it comes down to in this case, is um, was Oracle damaged in terms of a copyright law violation? And if um, Oracle was damaged, what's an appropriate way to um, award damages in this case? Um, you could argue that legal fees could go, could be paid. You could argue that um, whatever the actual damages are, I'm sorry, there's a couple ways you could weigh the, uh, how much the damage should be. Um, potentially, the damages could be as little as, um, well, one, the legal fees, and two, if we constructed this alternate history where Google had not violated the copyright but did everything else, um, where Google had just said, you know, we're going to produce our own language, we're going to produce our own operating system, and had otherwise had exactly the same market effect um, minus that it would just been more painful for developers and engineers and salespeople and everybody up and down the chain would have had this extra inconvenience with of having to learn a new language that has all the same capabilities as the old language um, or rather, maybe it wouldn't have all the same capabilities. Maybe it would not completely usurp the market at first. Maybe in this alternate history, um, it would have taken a few years for people to realize just that Google knew what it was doing and that they produce a compelling product that works excellently in the same space where Microsoft and Apple have not really succeeded in producing um, the same kind of market that Google has. Let's just say for argument's sake that in this alternate history, like, it takes Google one extra year, but otherwise they have exactly the same market effect that nobody wants to pay Oracle uh, the licensing fees to embed these chips and the manufacturing fees, and they'd rather pay um, uh, They'd rather install these other chips and deal with the ad revenues and such. I think that ultimately was going to prevail anyway. Google knows what it's doing with advertisements, it knows what it's doing with information collection. I think ultimately um, the amount of damages here are not as high as um, people think they are. And that kind of analysis, it's not something the Supreme Court wants to touch, is how much should be awarded, because that would require an extremely 
long, drawn-out analysis that really could be handled by any of the lower courts. The Supreme Court would rather address, um, spend its time addressing more complex matters um, than just, or rather higher order matters. They don't want to get stuck in the weeds of that kind of analysis. Would rather remand that down to lower courts to figure out just how much the damages would be. I think ultimately, um, yeah, Oracle's business model and Google's business model, uh, just if you compare those two business models, you'll see like the there, yes, Java is valuable, but the business model itself also contains value. So, and I think uh, Justice Thomas also agrees this in part three of his analysis that, um, well, how much would the damages be that we're even arguing about here? Um, and he suggests um, whether this favors one side or the other, if you had to consider fair use and you had to devise, if you had to split the baby here on um, these four points and the Supreme Court had to make a decision, um, they could make some kind of precedent that expands upon Congress's law and says which factors could be weighed in which ways. And um, so, yeah, I forget where it is in this opinion, but um, he states that we don't have to assume that the jury is necessarily going to award the largest possible damages and fees and whatever. We don't have to assume that um, this is going to break Google. Um, I mean, the jury is free to do as it will, but yeah, I can't find the statement here. Sorry about that. But somewhere there was a statement to the effect that um, even supposing that we did the fair use analysis and even supposing that Oracle comes out on top of this judgment, we don't have to also suppose that this is going to just destroy Google. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm so confused. Um, I guess I'll have to ask around to try to better understand what was going on here, because I had been long awaiting this de novo review to try to better understand these four use, these four factors of a fair use analysis and how they weigh against each other. This is something many people, I think, have been waiting for, it's like, give us another way that we could consider weighing these. And the Supreme Court really didn't want to weigh in on that kind of thing. And, and somehow here, the Supreme Court has concluded that this is fair use. And so they've managed to dodge the, four, you, you, uh, the fair use four-factor analysis with the way the majority opinion's written. So I guess what that means, and again, as Thomas says later on, he assumes that this uh, distinction between declarative code and implementing code um, is not binding for all cop, uh, all things copyright, but are is just binding for things like an API here. Um, yeah, I. I guess we'll have to wait until the next big lawsuit, however many years or decades that takes, to try to get a case before the Supreme Court where uh, we want to clarify these statutory for fair use four factors and how they weigh against each other in the case of this kind of copying. Um, I do wonder, eventually, you know, that like some... I mean, computers are complicated, businesses are complicated, eventually we're going to have some other kind of conflict involving computers and um, software and other things that are copyrightable. Maybe not software, I don't know what, but 
there's going to be some abstraction that is part of the technology sector that eventually is going to make it before the court again. And I wonder how that next case, whatever it is, whoever is involved, I wonder how that's going to pan out. Uh, it might be a long time before we see something like that. But when we do see it, again, we'll see if the court rules one way or the other or ends up um, finding that some factors rule in favor of one party, some factors rule in favor of a different party. I suppose in this case, if the court ever hit a, had a case like that, they would probably remand it back down to the lo lower courts to recommend um, some kind of judgment. And the lower courts uh, could render a judgment and then um, it could be appealed and the Supreme Court could decide whether or not to hear some aspects of the appeal. But yeah, this is... Uh, this is confusing that, yeah, I, I'll have to take a look at how this case got to back up to the Supreme Court. There must be some kind of in, interesting history behind this case for the court to have ruled this way on it, because I just don't understand. It doesn't seem to square with anything else except maybe the history of the case itself. And how it's gone up to the court and down and it's come up again. Maybe the court um, in visiting it a second time is considering things they heard the first time. Whereas I might not be so keen on what those things are that it's considering. I'm not sure. But yeah, this if you were to take this particular opinion out of the context of the entire history of this case and say that this same concept applies to all APIs that could have interesting effects on the market and people's willingness to share information with each other and people desiring to uh, conceal some things under letter of a trade secret if copyright is no longer effective. Uh, I could be overstating things. I just, I don't get this. It confuses me. Um, so, uh, I guess if you have happened to have read more about this, I'd like to know your thoughts on the matter. Uh, thanks for listening and thanks for watching.